Photography is a behind the camera thing and most photographers are introverts. Photography is boring. Jordan Matter has over 25 million followers on social media and his YouTube videos have been viewed over 4 billion times. I know so many people who say, I want to be in social media, but I'm 30. I'm like, you're young, I can be your dad. He started his career as a photographer with three best-selling books. So I made this book to do just that, using dancers to show the world as if seen through the eyes of a child. Last year, he made an abrupt pivot into the world of family vlogging. All I did was dancers and gymnasts and contortionists. So I needed to find a way to create content for everybody. We sit down with Jordan, Hudson, and Salish to talk about their YouTube journey together. I love working with you, but I don't have to work with you if you don't want to do it. I would like to start with how you've taken a passion, which is photography, and turned it into such a successful career. So where did your passion for photography start? And when did you realize that this is what you wanted to do with your life? It was a while ago. And I, I took a, a, a bike ride up to the top of a mountain with my wife. And when we got to the top of the mountain, I wanted to take a photo and I had no idea how to take the photo. So on the way down the mountain, I thought to myself, I'm gonna take a photography course and learn how to take that photo. And then I immediately thought maybe it could be a career one day. And then of course I put all those doubt in my mind. You know, you do like you think of this is what I would want. And then your brain automatically tells you all the reasons that's not gonna happen. Right. I had a long bike ride to think through all that stuff. And at the end of the bike ride, I said to my wife, I said, and I was a waiter at the time, so I didn't have a lot of money. And I said to her, I think I wanna take a photography course just to see if there's something there because I feel like I might have a passion for that. And she said, and I said, but it's expensive and it's gonna kind of take all my savings. Mm -hmm. And she said, you should do it because you never know what might happen. So for me, that first moment of her supporting me there in that journey is what started all. Because if she had said, wow. we don't have the money right now, it would have continued my waitering and all that, right? So I took the course and went, as soon as I did my first black and white print in the developer, I had this hallelujah moment. I don't know if you guys have experienced this, but I bet you have where it's like, it just washes over you and you realize this is it. This is my thing. Now I have to figure out how to make that a career, but at least yeah. I have the love for it. The way I made a career was I was a waiter because I was an actor, so actor, waiter, mm -hmm. right? I just started taking headshots of the hostesses, hosts, and waiters. And I, since I didn't know how to do lighting, I called myself a natural light photographer. It's <laughs> <laughs> just like I had to pitch it somehow. And nobody else was doing that. Yeah. All the headshots were like in a studio, boring, and I was outside in the middle of Times Square doing those photos. And it caught on because it was unique. You know, much like both of you, 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 you started with something that like was unique at the moment and now everybody tries to copy it, but you did it first, so you're known for it. That's what I did with natural light photography. And that's <laughs> where my headshot career started. That's amazing. Like when I hear that, I just love the idea of you having a conversation with your wife and how it could have gone two completely exactly. different ways. Right. Yeah. When was it where you started to see or some of the lessons you learned from photography that transferred over to social media or that's one part of the question. The other part is like, when do you start to even think of those two things kind of merging in that well, direction? Well, it's interesting because photography is a behind the camera thing and most photographers are introverts. And so they're, mm -hmm. it's actually very boring. Photography is boring. The creating of the photo is exciting, but the watch, observing photography is boring. So, but for me, one of my strengths wasn't necessarily that I was the best technician, but I loved it so much and I have a lot of energy that the people I was photographing got caught up in that. So it was a high energy kind of experience. I had the headshot career, it became very successful because I was the first one to do this and I started getting a lot of clients, but I was feeling a little artistically unfulfilled because it was the same thing every day, even though I loved it, similar stuff. And I was watching my son, he was, he was four, I think, three or four, play with his toy bus. And his level of enthusiasm for this small moment in his life made me realize, wow, we just skip over that stuff when we get older. And I was sitting there like, when is this gonna be over? Because I'm exhausted and I'm hungry. And I just stopped and I said, oh no, this is life stitching a bunch of little moments like this together, that's life. And I thought, how can I do a photo project like that? And it happens that day I'd photographed my first dancer. And I said, oh, I know what I could do. I could recreate everyday moments, but use dancers to show the beauty in those moments. Wow. Suddenly this, so this, cool. this, this like idea, dancers among us popped into my head. And I knew no dancers, but I called this one guy. I said, I just have this crazy idea. Can you get your company? Happened to be the best company in New York City, Paul Taylor Dance Company. They spent the summer walking around New York City with me as I was trying to figure out how do you shoot dance? How do you get the leap, all this stuff? 
And it became something that was unique. And that was my first experience with, with um, social media because Facebook, it started going viral on Facebook. And then, I mean, whole nother podcast, we could talk about how to get a book published, <laughs> but to speed through it after a lot of work, uh, it, it got published and became a New York Times bestseller. Wow. And it was just, it was about celebrating everyday moments and showing the beauty of those moments. Because the way I always see it is like, life is quick, you know? And I want it to be long. <laughs> so how do I make a quick life long is by really embracing and celebrating all the moments rather than just the big ones and not speeding through anything. And this was my way of showing that. And uh, I always think of my books, as, uh, four of them, as lessons to my kids. So that each one, each one represents a different lesson that I want them, life lesson I want them to take with them. That's really beautiful. Yeah. And you know, there's so many young people out there or even older people that they have these passions that they don't really know how to build a career off of that, right? Especially more artistic passion. So, you know, someone might wanna be a writer that's listening to this. Someone might wanna be a musician. Someone might wanna draw or be a yeah. dancer. How do you start to turn that into being a lucrative career? I remember you sharing a story with me that really touched me about how in the very beginning um, of your career as a photographer, you would do it for free yeah. and you wouldn't be making any money at all for a very long time. And then that moment that you actually were able to charge something, how do people turn their passions into an actual career? Right. I think the first thing has to do, especially if you're younger, with support of your family. So I, I've talked to a lot of people who have a passion but don't even want to express it because it's not the direction mm -hmm. their their parents had envisioned mm -hmm. for them. So I think that the first thing is that you hope that you have support around you from the people that matter most to you. The way I look at it is I could take photos of cockroaches or I could take photos of dancers, but what are people gonna wanna see more? They're gonna wanna see dancers. So you can invest the same amount of time in something that nobody wants to see, mm -hmm. or you can really invest your time in something that you think might resonate with the general public and it right. needs to mean something to you. So if you use the example of Dancers Among Us, two things, I thought, have I ever seen this? No. Would people want to see it? Yes. Am I passionate about it? Yes. If you can answer those three things, mm. then I think you have a pretty good shot. And then of course, the thing that is very obvious is just work your butt off, <laughs> right? Because mm -hmm. it's not going to do any good if you're not putting 15 hours a day into it in my mind. So right. as much effort as you can put into it. And yeah, the thing about my headshot career, I made a decision when I started this career that I still stand by today, which is I don't want to make any decisions based on money. Mm -hmm. So the first thing was, nobody knows who I am. I don't want to start trying to charge people. I just want to shoot for six months mm. and not charge anybody anything. And I remember the first time I charged, it was for $50. The film cost $50. <laughs> so I broke even and I was like, yes, I'm, like, somebody's willing to pay me. Mm -hmm. you know. And my, I remember my goal was ultimately, if I can charge $500 a headshot, and do three a week, I'll be set. Mm -hmm. That's 6,000 a month. Yeah, I was doing all the numbers. And within you know a few months, it was 1,000 per shoot, three a day, seven days a week. And, and it really took off. But I think it came from the passion. I think that is such great advice because so many people are worried, are overly consumed by how can you actually make money from this, right? And especially when you start explaining your dreams to other people, a lot of times other people will kill your dreams because you haven't figured the financial part of it right. out. But yourself and a lot of other successful people that we've talked to, one common trait is they never started with the money aspect. Absolutely. They just started with what is their passion? What do they love doing? How can they make it different? And then over time, it led to success. And that's worked out yeah. so well for you. You know, there's this uh, common perception that young people are told that they're too young to go after their dreams mm -hmm. or they're, they don't know what they're doing, right? And that's why they need to listen to their teacher or their parent or whoever else that's gonna steer them in their life direction. You've actually found your passion later on in life. Mm -hmm. And when you think of most YouTubers, you know, they're in their teens yep. or early or in their early 20s. So what was it like when you actually broke into YouTube, you know, being Old. older than- <laughs> <laughs> Can you replay the way you tried to say that? Being like, what am I supposed to say? In full disclaimer, 
disclaimer, okay? If it wasn't for Jordan, I'd be the oldest guy on YouTube. <laughs> so I'm but very grateful you for decades. your existence. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, I, pr yeah. I pride myself in that. I believe, and I've checked it, that I'm the oldest person with uh, over 10 million subscribers. Yeah. Like, wow. oh, ever, that's, in the history oh of ever. Dude, right? that's, so that's like, to be the first at anything, yeah, even it means the oldest. I yeah. mean, there's so many adults out there that feel like it's too late for yeah. them now, Oh yeah, right? of course. And especially you have responsibilities, you have right, a mortgage, right. you have kids. How do you give up all, or not give up all of that, but say, hey, I'm gonna go in this totally different career path that is not stable, where I don't know yeah. how much money I'm gonna make. Where does that, courage come from and then I guess how did you break through in that space once we started I started doing YouTube it was um I had two kids a house mortgage all that and I didn't stop my job and I think that's mm. the important thing I, mm. I don't I don't I don't I think when you're young hey just whatever throw a backpack on go somewhere what does right. it matter for me I was juggling and by juggling that meant I had no time so I replaced I had made three books by then I just replaced the book passion with the YouTube passion mm. and I kept the day job of headshots as a way to supplement that and I held on to it for a very long time because I was concerned that this could just be a fleeting thing and then I would have lost my ability to provide for my family and all mm -hmm. that but I started older than, I, I mean, definitely than you would say your average YouTuber is, but it was it was all an accident. And the way it happened was uh, my friend Sandy, who uh, is my co-producer on the channel, he was filming videos for me because we were making videos of, of the dancers to prove to people that it was real. Because everybody thought I was Photoshopping these photos because what the dancers can do is so extraordinary. So we started making these behind the scenes <laughs> videos. And then he just threw out, you know, if we, if we were able to post these on YouTube, um, we could get access to their studio once a month for free. That was the goal. But you have to have 10,000 subscribers. Yeah. He said. It's like, where are we gonna get 10,000 subscribers? We have, a, I have like two. And that was the first step. And like, let's just try it to see if we can one day, yeah. one day wow. down the road, Damn. get 10,000 subscribers. What I love about that story is that I think you're so right that a lot of people think you just have to quit your job yeah. and then you're, trying to time it right. Yes. Everyone's like, okay, well, when do I quit my job and how do I start yes. this new thing? Yes. And you're like, actually, we just did both. both. Because yes. that was, yeah. Just right. meant less sleep. Yes, That's of all. course. Yeah. And, and the, but the thing yeah. is, is I think the timing idea is also procrastination. Correct. Oh, yeah. I'm not, it's not right. I can't do that. Like, and it has to all be lined up just perfectly. You can always mm -hmm. find an excuse why it's not lined up just perfectly. Yeah. And so for me, I just felt like there was a, a real opportunity. And some, I don't think, they happen a lot in life where you can see a potential trajectory, but you just know you're gonna have to work your butt off and probably fail for a long time before you see mm -hmm. the benefits of that work. Yeah. And I think that's one thing I've always been willing to do. When I did Dancers Among Us, it was two years before anybody cared. And I would go downtown after a day of shooting headshots and I would shoot all night dancers. And my wife would call and she'd say, literally, Hudson just took his first steps. Mm. And I'd be like, Oh my God, I'm, I'm, I miss that. Or well, actually it would be Salish because he was older, but you know, like that kind of thing. You know, she crawled for the first time, this, that, the other. I'd come home and they were already asleep and I would hear somebody go, daddy, 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 while I was shooting, but it wasn't for me. Like all that stuff, it ripped me apart because mm -hmm. nobody was paying attention and nobody cared about this project. And I would go and shoot it any day anyway without any financial benefit. And it was only because I believed in it that I thought it could be something. And fortunately, I stuck with it. Because if I hadn't done that book, honestly, I wouldn't be here right now for sure. Because oh, wow. that's what led to everything. But it was those years of pushing through without any idea that it would be successful. And everybody has that story. I know your story very well. It's the, it, it, everybody's story where you have that down period mm -hmm. and then you find mm -hmm. the peak. You know, I think a lot of partners, parents, there's this constant battle between you want to be there as often as possible. You want to attend every birthday party you can, every yeah. anniversary. You know, you want to be there all on the weekends. But then there's this entrepreneurial bug inside of you or this passion that's burning inside of you that you know you have to fulfill yeah. your own, you know, destiny as well. So as someone who wasn't present, you know, during those first steps of your child and now someone who has created enough success where you have a lot more time that you can spend yeah. with your kids and you actually get to work with them, do you regret not being there for those special moments in order to build a career? Or what would your advice be to those people that want to do something but know is going to take away from their family life? That's so hard. I I miss the moments. I, I, I miss that I didn't get more time. 
but I don't regret it. It's almost like I wish I could have lived two lives parallel, <laughs> you know? And I mean, I would make choices where the book deal was just about, you can shoot in New York and I would choose mm -hmm. to fly all over Europe and all over because it was gonna be a better book. Right. I didn't make more money as a result, it's just gonna be a better book, but that meant that much more time away from them. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a hard decision. And the hardest part is you don't know if it's gonna succeed. Mm -hmm. And we hear the stories from the people that it succeeded. So in the end, you're like, yeah, that was worth it. But what about somebody who put three years away and it never worked? And then they just look back and they missed all this stuff and it didn't, it's, a re, it's really a difficult decision. But yeah. for me personally, I'm very, I'm very grateful that I made the choice to do it. Yeah, I was gonna ask you, uh, Jordan, what age is your current audience on YouTube? Like Tweens and teens primarily, and then co-viewing. So I think um, some kids will watch it with their parents. Do you remember being a tween? Yeah. Like when, when you were that age? Yeah, I do. What do you think now that you're like creating for that audience, mm -hmm. And, you know, with your children, I wonder what was different about what you felt you needed then and what you were entertained by then versus what you're seeing people be entertained by. Oh, that's now. interesting because <laughs> that was a while ago. Yeah. Like that was a minute, you know? So the idea, like when I was 12. But Dara already aged. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so like, now let's just talk about it. Right? Now we just lay like, in, right? Yeah. I mean, it was, <laughs> it was like cassette stuff. It was like a cassette and a Walkman. And, and that, that's kind of what I did all day. I, you know, ride a bike and listen to music, right? When I was younger, I was very shy. And I was bullied a lot. And role models then didn't talk about their personal lives. So you didn't know that somebody else had been through that. So they seem like the perfect people. And that's one of the things that we always try to do in our content. We're aware that we have a younger mm -hmm. audience that can be influenced. And especially with Salish, you know, that a lot of girls that are her age look up to her. And we always talk about the responsibility we have to share, not just the, the great stuff, but just all the stuff. Because I, I just, I remember very specifically, I was on a bus, I was exactly Salish's age. And the kid behind me was tying my hair in knots and I was pretending not, not to notice. Everybody was laughing. I got off the bus, everybody spit on me and the bus drove away. And I just remember like feeling like all alone. I didn't have brothers or sisters. I didn't have to talk about it with my parents and there was no role model who could speak to that. I think now the advantage is, is we invite these, uh, the audience into our homes and they feel like they know us. So, but that comes with a huge responsibility to be aware of the message that we're putting out there and realizing that they are inspired by what we do and they listen to what we say and the messages are important. We really think about that a lot when we create our content is what is this message and would this message resonate with me when I was a kid or with Salish or with Hudson? So Salish, uh, how has it been just, you've you know, gotten this meteoric rise in, in popularity recently. I, I don't know if two years ago, it's safe to say, you know, you weren't getting stopped and recognized everywhere you go to now your videos have tens of millions of views on them. What has that transition looked like from not being as known to now being as popular as you are? Well, I think it's like been like, I really like it because I think it's very nice of them to come up and I really like that they like watch me and they like care. So I think it's really nice. Like sometimes they come up when I'm at gymnastics and I think that's really great. Yeah, I really like it. And is it hard to balance having a family life and friends and doing all the things that you're passionate about while also trying to film? Yeah, I definitely try to like balance it out and I kind of try to keep it separate. Like I don't really like filming at my, like where I go to gymnastics mm. stuff and I don't really like filming with my friends. So I don't really talk about it with them because I kind of like having separate like paths with them. Yeah, but yeah. I remember, you know, being... 12, 13, 14 myself, I didn't think my parents were the coolest people. And I think a lot of young people don't really want to hang out with their parents, but you got to hang out with your dad and your brother all the time. Uh, so do you think your dad is the coolest person on the planet? I know you like to Definitely make Definitely not. <laughs> what about me? What about me? No. <laughs> yeah. What? She bashes me in the videos and that's no joke. <laughs> What's it like working with your dad and your brother? I really like it because I think, yeah, I think like it's brought us closer and we get to see each other more. I think going back to the question about um, working together, yeah. uh, obviously, 
she started doing the channel fairly regularly when she was 10, 10 and a half, and now she's almost 13. There's going to be a transition there as well. Hudson has his own channel, so he does his own thing. He, jo he joins us sometimes, but his, his path is his content. And for me, what, what I, if, you, if you look at a video from two years ago versus now, you'll see much less screen time of me now than it was two years ago, because inevitably, I would imagine becoming behind the camera and allowing her to take over the channel for her journey as a teenager, because I don't know that a 16-year-old is going to be like, one wanting to hang out and beat up her dad as part of the content, you know? <laughs> so there's a natural evolution right. where I don't expect that it will always be us and she mm -hmm. might just take it and run with it yeah. on her own. Hudson, I know you've had some incredible experiences and just watching your journey on YouTube has been amazing. You're, you. you're crushing it. You're doing so well. I've also recently saw you get to ask Mr. Beast a question in front of sure. a live audience <laughs> and you're getting to experience all these cool things that I'm sure a lot of young people would love to experience. What has been the coolest moment that's come from you I having this YouTuber? Ask that. Um, <laughs> I think um, being interviewed by Colin and Samir was, I don't know if you guys know who that yeah, is. Yeah, I know yeah. Colin and Samir, yeah. Dude, I, I had seen, I think like every, it's safe to say like almost every one of their videos coming up yeah. like to that period. And then it was just a few months ago and they just asked me a few questions um, about YouTube and, you know, storytelling and all that type of thing. And it really just being able to be interviewed by someone who had inspired me so much mm. just in my own content journey. And, and I, yeah, I don't know. It was just such a tremendous experience. Uh, it, it didn't. It didn't even feel real because I had been so used to just watching their videos and then you know having them a ask a question and then having someone else answer it and then being like having to answer it <laughs> myself was like a whole new experience. But yeah. yeah, I think that overall was a really like you know turning moment. And I know so many young people want to be YouTubers as careers. It's yeah. unbelievable mm -hmm. as to how that's the most common response: either athlete, gamer, YouTuber. Uh, at what point did you know that you wanted that to be your career, if if that is an accurate statement? I don't know. I don't know if I can give you like an exact time. It's more so like I I really just I really love it. Like I I you know so much of what I think about it is just YouTube or you know analytics or like how to make the best video. Probably like about like four or five months ago, it really just kicked in like my mm. just like burning passion for it. And so I since then I've honestly just been like hyper obsessing over it. So it's. I don't know. It's kind of like a like a generic answer, but I don't know. I I it's hard to pinpoint like an exact time, but kind of I don't know. I just I love it. And just being able to be like surrounded by people who do it naturally and talk to so many other creators constantly has just really been able to fuel my passion for it. I feel like what's happening on YouTube and the way people are creating today is just transformed yeah. from, you know, where it started. What do you think today makes a great video? I, I think there's like a shift in like people who are really high up, at, like creators are kind of shifting from just analytics to, you know, telling like just a great story and not, not as much worrying about the analytics. I'd say the most important thing for me is focus on the algorithm or, you know, the algorithm or like focus on analytics, get a really, really good understanding of, you know, what's audience retention, APV versus AVD, you know, things like that, click through rate all huge. Um, and so really make your video coexisting with the algorithm or with analytics and focus on how to make the best video that has to do with that. Um, cause that's when you'll see like really, you know, big success. My, I know my views skyrocketed when I started like really obsessing over the like real time analytics. Um, and then also try to come up with a way to tell a good story. Um, and that's like such a, you know, generic answer, but I think you know, if you, if, if there's like a really strong reason that's related to the piece of content that you're making and that, that thing at the end, like there's a reason to watch the whole video until the end, um, that's like interrelated with the, the type of video you're making. I think doing something like that is just, it's going to be huge. And, you know, you'll see your retention skyrocket and things like, that. I mean, there's like a million like little things mm -hmm. I could say, but I mean, it's, it's honestly just about like studying analytics, getting a really under good understanding about that, watching other creators that share your audience, um, and then really just, you know, understanding how to tell a good story. And then just just do it. Like just make, you know, 50, 100 videos before, you're going to make like, you know, 100 videos before you see any success at all. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of just get out there and just start making videos. There's yeah, no great other way. Advice. Yeah. I guess my thinking right now is like when I'm seeing a family come together and I want to come back to you, Jordan, as well, like, I find like your forward thinking to be really quite remarkable. And what gave you the courage in the first place to include the family and to do it that way, knowing the risks and the challenges that come with that? Because right. I can imagine that's 
as a self-aware parent, which it sounds like you are, it's like, that's feels like a lot of pressure. And, you know, you've probably seen where it's gone right and where that's been challenging. How, sure. how did you have the courage? What kind of conversations did you all have? Like, tell us a bit more about that, because I think there might be lots of parents who are in that kind of middle sure. boat. And I'd love for them yeah. to have a, a sense of like what to think about, what kind of conversations. Well, the first thing I think is that there's a, I've, I've worked with a, a lot of families that do content, right? And there is a pressure on the kid because they feel like they have to carry the channel. The, our good fortune is the channel was already successful when I started working with them, especially with Salish. So she knows that she doesn't, this, it's more successful now, no doubt, but we'll, we'll be good if she wants to stop. And she doesn't have the responsibility of carrying it. And I've just seen the negative aspect of that, where then there's pressure from the parent, you gotta create, you gotta create. And it just, it's not healthy for them or for the relationship. So the first thing is just for them to know, I love working with you, but I don't have to work with you if you don't want to do it. That's mm. that. That's a very I, important element. I also think just stepping in, not to like interrupt or anything, but I think it was kind of on a like, yeah, I was on a roll. Yeah. I, I had a lot. I, I was gonna. Yeah. I think there's some aspect too where it's like, why are you starting, right? So for you know her, like. I, I don't want to, you know, like put words in your mouth or anything, but I imagine it's it's not like, you know, you didn't start a channel or anything, right? It's your channel and then you kind of brought her in, in a sense, right? So it's right. it's kind of, if if you, it's like, how does the channel almost get started? Um, and for Salish, I think she, she didn't like come up and was like, oh, I really want to, you know, make videos almost in a sense, or like you kind of were like, hey, I think this could work well. And then through that, she developed like well, a passion actually, for Well, actually, just it. to be really specific about <laughs> yeah, what yeah. happened, there, we, we would do challenges with both of them. We did a lot of challenges. But there was one moment that actually changed my whole perspective on, on YouTube. And it was, we were moving from New York to LA, and I did a video about Sailor saying goodbye to her gymnastics friends. And we n rarely did videos that had an, um, anything emotional about them. And specifically with Sailor, she's not the biggest fan of emotion at all. Like if we're like, you say something and she'll be like, no, that's emotional. I'm not going to do that. Right? So, <laughs> but she did allow us to tell this story about, and, and the response was really powerful and the views were huge. And it, was, and it started making me think that there's another direction to take YouTube beyond pranks and challenges and all that stuff. And it is about storytelling. And it just happens to be that she's exactly at the age where much of our audience sits. And so Mm -hmm. that all those stories are resonating with them. And that's when I started going in the direction of maybe we should do more of that. And every time I would include her in the, in the content, the views would spike. And I think because people were starting to like the relationship they were seeing. And before that, the channel was reliant on whatever collaborator I had. So if I was working with Charlie, I knew the views were going to skyrocket because it's Charlie. And it, it was always that I was the fun late night talk show host, making them do crazy things with and taking photos of them. They were all interchangeable. There was no through line. Now there's a relationship with my kids. There's a through line in the content. So people tend to get a lot more engaged week to week, which is I think what has led to the higher viewership. Yeah, it's a great answer. Yeah. There was not a whole lot of thought ahead of time because I don't think any of us anticipated the degree of success it would have. Mm -hmm. So those conversations have been throughout, like this is mm -hmm. getting a little bigger, are you okay with this? You know, How do we manage this? Mm -hmm. Things like that. Salish, what's been your favorite or most fun video or story that you've kind of been a part of or that was the most fun to make behind the scenes? I really like the fr the videos with my friends. So like I really like doing them with Nadal because he's one of my closer friends. So probably like the water park one or we did a haunted house one. Yeah. And that was really fun because we could just walk around like behind like the scenes and we could like go on the rides, stuff like that. What about your, I, have a, I know what your least favorite video was. What? The one where I filled your room. I, I did a video where I filled uh, her room with um, photos of Nadal. <laughs> Great video for retention, by the way. If any, I don't know where the camera is, but if anybody, nice plug, by the way. See that? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. See that? Yeah. It's like we, we got. We haven't really talked about my channel. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let me plug this video. Well, I would just look at one of these cameras. You can cut to that one. If you want a viral video, go fill your sibling's room with photos of no. someone there associated. Took, she got very upset. Um, by he yeah, she took didn't out like that every single thing in my room. So I mean, like, I think all the, the, the idea is when you're working with kids, and the 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 it needs to be fun. 
right? But, but production often isn't. It's, there's a lot of stopping and starting. And so what we try to do is come up with concepts where she, and especially with her best friend, can just go have an experience they wouldn't have had otherwise. So now we're doing something that we wouldn't have done. We flew to Texas, we wouldn't have done that. And you get to hang out with him, go to a water park. And now they get to have a lot of fun. And then we shoot that fun. Yeah. That's always the best. When we're doing content with adults, she's great. Probably not as much fun though, right? As if you're with kids, because yeah. why yeah. wouldn't you want to hang out? Like with us, kids? basically, is what you're trying to say. Like right now, yeah, she's yeah, 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 she's yeah, like, yeah. Oh, but if fun. you were Nadal, she'd yeah, be all exactly. over this. That's the problem. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> should should have had uh, Ella, Ella Rose and uh, Milo Sky. Yeah. Like, uh, <laughs> that, the then we would be good. Like, yeah. That would have been better. Yeah. Yeah. Everything you're sharing too, I think, is just great advice for anyone out there that's looking to create a family business. You know, it's respecting each other's happiness and decision-making, starting with strong family values, which I think is so important and a big part of your success. Because you've seen so many family businesses or creators go astray because that value system right. wasn't there to begin with. And third, most importantly, have fun. <laughs> yeah. Because if you're not having fun, ultimately, you're not going to want to continue doing it for the longer run. Is it hard? Like I run a, I run a business and all the different things I do is with my, with my wife, Laura, and we're always trying to figure out how to balance being in this partnership, but also just being a family. And then sometimes, especially we have a family vlog, so your most important moments, you wanna get on camera, but you also wanna be in the moment. Yeah. And I know a lot of people face that trade-off between, hey, there's this beautiful sunset and you wanna try to story every moment of it versus just, hey, let's just have a moment to ourselves. How do you balance those things? Hudson and I went on a trip a few years ago and we were gonna vlog the whole thing. It was like a three state thing. Mm. And after about a, two days, I just like, I, I don't like this at all. I, I wanna just live the moment. I don't wanna vlog everything. So now we have specific shoot days. We have a concept, mm -hmm. we're shooting all day. And then the rest of the day, we're not trying to document anything. Yeah. But we did get a pretty good vlog out of it. <laughs> <laughs> On the did, first was, few days, we got some painful. good content. It was painful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, th I think that's hard. I think when you're doing daily vlogging and you're trying to document your life, uh, it, it can be it can be a lot because yeah. every moment and we've had a few of those right where I'll say okay wait, wait wait hold on hold on hold on and then like no that was a real moment she's actually amazing at calling me out on that stuff like there there will be right, right like we'll be shooting something and I'll look at her a certain way and she's like no that's for the camera <laughs> like that's not a real interaction between us and she almost tell, tell me if I'm mistaken here. It's almost like if it's, you don't want to capitalize on your relationship in yeah. a way. Yes. Uh, by, yeah. by pretending something's real when it's not real mm -hmm. yeah. or reshooting them. Oh, that was a great moment. We didn't get it. Can we reshoot that and make it? And she always will say, wow. no, because it's not, you missed it. <laughs> so you missed it. I'm not going to recreate the moment for you. Yeah. Um, and that, and I think that's, that's, I've learned that from her. Like we missed it. We're going to move on rather than re reenact something that was real for a moment. That's yeah. so mature, Celis. That's unbelievable <laughs> that you can tell the difference. That's that's really quite- Well, once in a while, she'll say, you're looking at me that way. I say, I'm just looking at you. Yeah. Like this, there's nobody even filming. You're like, you're giving me a YouTube look. <laughs> so she keeps me honest. You it's do a, that YouTube look, Hugo. <laughs> <laughs> what what does the YouTube right look me? mean to you? What does that mean? Like, what's a YouTube look? Like he's trying to make it emotional. <laughs> <laughs> he's going like this. Yeah. I'm trying to show an emotional connection. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to show an emotional connection. She she cuts that down real yeah. quick. So uh, the content is is real uh, for no other reason than she demands it be. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I will sometimes want to enhance it with yeah, an emotional yeah. moment and a look at her that makes it. And then we'll swell the music and it'll be really sweet. And she'll just go, no, no, nope. <laughs> that's so brilliant. We get what we get. <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. I'm so happy to see your family winning. Yes. Yeah, you know, yeah. there, there is this stereotype, I guess, of, um, you know, family content creators where certain mm -hmm. things are forced or uh, you're, you're trying to get a certain level of emotion from this or there's not longevity in that. But the fact that you guys are so value based, you're, you're such, you know, a, a great role model for so many families out there just makes yeah. me so happy. So you guys deserve all the success that absolutely. you have, like without yeah, a doubt. Absolutely. Thank you. Sailor on a lighter note, um, you, you've got to meet some really cool people. I know your dad has collabed with some really awesome people. Has there been a guest that you've been really excited about meeting or that you've always idolized that you got to meet in real life? And what was that experience like? Other than me. Other than <laughs> <laughs> I really wanted to meet this really cool gymnast named Jordan Childs, and I got to do a competition with her, and that was really fun because I got to learn a lot of things from her. 
like from my gymnastics. So that was really cool. Yeah, mm -hmm. she was an Olympian this year. Oh, wow. And uh, it was it was really beautiful because we did a, a gymnastics challenge against an Olympian. Mm -hmm. But she was taking the time to really, like at, at, when it was her turn to compete, she would give her a pep talk and teach her some things. Oh, That's wow. and amazing. Just, and, and, and the idea is, you, you know, you work with these people that are all up here on a pedestal. And then when you get into the room one-on-one, -on -one, we're just people. And when they treat Salish or Hudson or me like we're equals, She's with the level six gymnast. She's an Olympian, mm. but you couldn't tell. And that, that, that's, with those, that's a beautiful person who just takes the that's time amazing. to make you feel like that. Yeah. And I know you've collabed with Charlie D'Amelio, yeah. with mm -hmm. Addison Ray. How did those collaborations come about? And what was the experience like working with them? Charlie was an interesting one because she was just on the cusp when I first worked with her. Oh, wow. So she had just blown up a couple of weeks before. She had been actually a big fan of my work because she was mm. a dancer and she knew my dance photography. So when, I guess they reached out to me or something, but anyway, the call with Charlie was she was get, like, couldn't believe <laughs> she had the opportunity to work with me. Like, that changed, <laughs> but like that, that's how new she was. Oh, wow. And we met at Grand Central to do a 10 minute photo challenge. And, and some people were saying hi to her. I said, how long has this been going on for you? She said, a few days, Oh, shoot. right? So it was just wow. starting. Wow. Wow. Two months later, we worked again in Santa Monica. And by then it was like screaming people. I heard Charlie and the mobs of people running around, where's Charlie, where's Charlie? It had all happened within two months. Wow. Um, but it was, it was a lot. She's a very uh, like polite person. And so we did, we did a whole video and then we shot a second video and I asked her to do a dare where she got on a counter and the person got upset that she got on the counter and she was done for the day. Like she was so upset that somebody was angry at her. They really affected her emotionally. Fast forward a few months and there was so much hate about her online. I just wonder like how as a family did they manage that? Cause wow. she seems like I only from the outside, like she, things are okay, but it's a lot for somebody that sensitive to handle. Yeah. You know? wow. But but the, the collab with her was amazing. And the, like I said, I've gotten a chance to work with most people and the idea that YouTubers are self-centered, that's not true, really. Most people are not. They're generous and they want to have fun and and everybody wants to be creative and it's it's a supportive environment. It's not a competitive one. Yeah, that's beautiful to hear. How about you, Hudson? Who's uh, someone that you look forward to uh, collabing with? Or, or have. Like, yeah, or oh, have. God. Yeah, both, both. I yeah. want to do a video where I... Um, I, I buy a car. I buy my first Can ever car. Can I just car. establish he can't drive? <laughs> well, well, here's the thing. Here, I want to I wanna buy a car. I want to get my permit before. Buy a car. <laughs> you need 50 hours of driving experience before you can get a license. So the idea is to bring a, a YouTuber artist out, have work with them to customize the car, drive it like 3,000 miles to North Carolina, give it to Mr. Beast as my like 50 hours of driving experience. Oh, wow. So that's my, that's like, so that is a video I've been trying to plan for a while and I've been looking forward to doing. Um, and I know Matthew Beam, who I talk to a lot, he's a <laughs> YouTuber um, and he did a similar video a while back. So he, I want to, I want to talk to him about it too. Yeah. yeah I, <laughs> well, we, we might have to get you a helicopter or yeah, a, exactly. a plane, <laughs> like, you know, to up yeah. the stakes. That yeah, exactly. Cool. <laughs> I have an interesting story about Hudson just because, um, that I think all of this YouTube is because of him for me, to be honest, because when we just started doing it and I was just starting to get some traction, uh, he was 12 and he was watching YouTube and he had this, this philosophy about YouTube that I still follow to this day. He was like, okay, dad, here's the deal. If you get popular <laughs> on YouTube, it's because you found a lane and you got to stay in that lane. But if you stay in the lane too long, people are going to get bored and they're going to stop watching. So but if smart. you get out of your lane, people aren't going to like it and they're going to stop watching. So the only option you're going to have is to expand your lane. Mm -hmm. And this is, agree. this is still, wow. so when we started pivoting, because we were doing, we had 200 videos of photography challenges and we thought the channel had to be about photography channels and the views were starting to go a little bit lower and lower. And I started thinking about that advice, like how do we pivot away from this? And that's when sales started coming in. As I was trying to have that, that conversation, her videos were taking off and it wasn't necessary that I was taking photos. Yeah. In so the idea of pivoting, we still stayed in the lane. She was in the lane. She had been introduced as a character, mm -hmm. but we pivoted this way. And I think one of the things that's important for creators to think about is just because you've had success at one thing doesn't mean that's the only thing you have to do. You have an audience that cares about your content, but like take those people seriously and give them content that you would want to watch. Yeah, yeah, that's super great advice. That was, that was amazing advice. Yeah.
Uh, and I, I think we've benefited in our own careers just in pivoting as well. And I know, Jay, like when you went from being the top Facebooker in the world to crushing podcasts to crushing books, you followed that same strategy. Well, yeah, it was just, it was, it, that's why it resonated so much. Like I remember that feeling of having like billions of views on a platform and, you know, one video having like 386 million views on one video and then wow. watching just creators who'd come before me and kind of seen like just shelf life and lifeline mm -hmm. and just <laughs> looking at like someone trying to do something for too long yeah. and exactly that piece of advice. And so for me, it was like, well, yeah, how do we move into different mediums? And then it was like physical as well, like doing a book or my wife right. and I have a sparkling tea line together and things like that. Mm -hmm. By the way, I don't it's, know your wife, but she's hysterical. Oh, she's amazing. Yeah, she's yeah. Very they were fun. just yeah, both our wives her, were yeah. just. Yeah, I, I saw Laura in the parking lot. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, but yeah, but yeah, I yeah. like her Instagram. Yeah, she's very, amazing. Very funny yeah, woman. she's like, like she did yeah. an impersonation of you for a day. And yeah, good stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, humor is the basis of everything, right? So, like if you yeah. can laugh together. Yeah. So yeah. you, you leave your socks on the couch. Is that I, you? Do you know what the thing is? That that video made me very sad because the comment section was. Oh, we realized Jay is like that now. <laughs> and my thing is like, she made half of that. Up. Like, I was like, she made it up. She's Perception just, is everything. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But, uh, but no, that's such smart advice. And you can yeah. definitely add that to your list of good, good creative advice. It also depends like when transitioning content, like we're talking about, uh, it's, it's important to say like, do you have a personal connection with the audience or do they just like the content, but then not actually like care about you necessarily. Mm -hmm. And so it's, one of the, the important things is that I try to do a lot in the videos um, is like make sure as best as I can that the audience personally cares about me and not just about the video I'm making. Um, so when you transition, it's easier to be like, okay, I want to try this type of content now. And the audience is more inclined mm. to watch it because, you know, they care about you. And they're like, okay, I want to see what you do next. Mm. Um, so that often like practical advice like has to do with you know, leaving a video, like you could be so retention focused, like I need to make it this, this cuts like this, 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 but you know, letting a video, like slowing it down a little bit, letting the characters mm -hmm. play out more, developing the connection um, between the character and the audience um, just like helps it overall. Even if you see the retention go down yeah. a little bit. Yeah, I got to have a whole mastermind session with I you. Know, <laughs> I know, how to improve I, our I, videos. It's yeah, funny, because we, we were at Vid Summit where you spoke brilliantly. Oh, yeah, way. Good, good it, go watch it online yeah. wherever the yeah, camera go, is. Yeah, go yeah. see. <laughs> but, Buy Vid Summit replay. So, so Hudson is at Vid Summit at, for, for, what was it, two days, right? Three days. In, in Hog's Heaven, like yeah. nonstop creators everywhere. And before I know it, more people are like talking to him, getting his number he, than me. And I was like, wait, but he's my kid, isn't But he's, this is his yeah. world, right? Yeah. So he, he's gotten an opportunity to meet a lot of creators and then expand his, yeah. his belief system about YouTube beyond just mine and yeah. into his own world. Well, I, I thank him so much just for being able to like bring me to these things too. Cause I, I, I love learning about YouTube and it's, it's, it's just my favorite thing in the world. Like it's, it's really like all I think about. So it's, it's kind of, it's just such such an amazing experience, and I'm I'm so 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 beyond grateful for you and just like bringing bringing me to these places because I, I I just love it. That's beautiful. I'm lucky. Cool. I have a pretty cool career, <laughs> so I get to, they get to yeah. see. Yeah, yeah. It's also you having the humility and the understanding of transitioning from in front of screen to behind screen, and I think we're living in a generation today where everyone thinks that the most important person is on screen. Mm -hmm. And so the problem is that everyone's trying to be on screen. Mm -hmm. And you look at history and you go, well, who directed some of your favorite movies? It wasn't the actors. And, and I feel like that's something that I want a lot more people to mm -hmm. think about. It's like, yeah. you don't have to be on screen to be talented, successful, right. happy, yes. fulfilled. And Yes, and the flip side of that is, if it's talent, if, if it's successful, that doesn't mean it's all because of your glowing personality totally. on screen. Yeah. Because I think a lot of times is you see the views and this is something that, <laughs> what do I tell you all the time? What are you telling me? Yeah, you know, like, when you're oh, like, don't worry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, don't get used to it. <laughs> well, hopefully a nicer version of that. But I'm like, this is, you know, we're very, very fortunate right now. But the right now is only lasts as long as we're willing to put in the effort and time to make great content mm -hmm. and to tell stories that resonate with audiences. And the second we get lazy and stop doing that right. and just rely on, wow, we, we're cool, right? We yeah. get views, yeah. right? Yeah. People just love us. Yeah. Then that's when people, can they can feel it. They can 100%. feel that you're not invested. Right. And that's where the long shoots come from. And that's where mm -hmm. all that stuff comes from. It's like, oh, but 
that's what builds the connection is yeah. taking the time for those small moments in the videos. And that's true about any business that could be mm -hmm. said. A lot of times people start with like a certain mission and then along the way you get used to that success and then you lose the thing that made you successful to begin with. Yeah, uh, yes. And uh, it, yeah. it happens with scaling, right? right. It happens with, yeah. we've been talking about, do we bring on more people and give some creative control over? Oh, and my, sure. my issue is I find shoots to be, be more and more stressful now mm -hmm. because I'm trying to think about more things and direct while being in front and then worrying like how's she feeling, how's everybody else feeling? But to let go of that control, will I still have the same product in the end? Yeah. And how much of the, the success of it is that control? Right. Yeah. Uh, so, so it's hard. It's, it's definitely hard to scale up and to broaden and to still keep it intimate. Well, yeah, I think this has been a really special interview. Well, <laughs> Hudson, I'm, I'm so excited to see where your career goes. Thank I definitely so get vibes yeah. to see that you're going to be the top YouTuber on the <laughs> platform, I've no doubt. And I, I'm really yeah. excited to see where you guys go and, and where this podcast takes you. Yeah. Combining Thank the you. audiences, like I was telling you about before, so smart. Um, but yeah, make sure you guys <laughs> like this podcast. I don't know where this will be posted to, but if it's on YouTube, yeah. like this video, subscribe right now, and they're yep. going to give $1,000 away to someone who subscribes. <laughs> okay. $1,000 yeah. in the next seven days, subscribe. someone who subscribes. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. And Jordan, I have no doubt that you're going to be the first grandparent at some point to also have over, I don't know, 50 million subscribers. Wow. Or 10 wow. million. He's close. One day. <laughs> I'm age close, but I'm not close to having a grandkid. Believe me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Sailors, how how was your very first podcast interview? You survived good. it. Good. Thank yeah. you for having me. You, you did a good you'll job. be you back. Job. Yeah, you did a great job. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you. Awesome. Thank you guys. This is awesome. You guys did so good. Thank you.